Welcome back, WNST, Towson, from Baltimore and Baltimore Positive. We are positively into an election week, and there's all sorts of coverage at Baltimore Positive, everything from Nancy Pelosi and the Dutch Ruppersberger and Steny Hoyer to fresh chats with Martin O'Malley and John Sarbanes, amongst others. But it is Pittsburgh week around here, and I, I love getting together with the people of Pittsburgh, whether it's hockey, whether it's baseball. I went out to this guy's uh, Twitter page, and he's got like this mural of Dave Parker that comes straight from every nightmare I ever had in 1979. And this guy tells me he grew up in Maryland. Will Graves from the Associated Press, one of our favorites to have back on. Uh, always good to hear from you, but you know, on the Zoom world, I get to look at you and Charlie Batch and look <laughs> at you and Ed Bouchette and look at all the yins and that. And uh, how are you, man? You feeling all right? Life's good? I, yeah, man, I am, I am good. Um, and Steny Hoyer actually spoke of my high school graduation uh, many, many moons ago. Um, I'm still surprised he's in politics. Good for him, I guess. Um, I can't tell you anything memorable about, uh, the, I mean, it's my high school graduation. Who remembers? Let me tell you this. Shut yeah. up so we can move on so I can get to the after party. No, no, no. I want to give a Steny Hoyer shout out here, especially for the segment, because I brought his name up and, to my wife, and my wife wasn't fully familiar because he's not from this part of the state. My wife didn't live here 25 years ago when he was entrenched in Annapolis and state politics, you know, and, and I only know the name through that and whatever. And, you know, if he were on my airplane, I, you know, I would know who he is, but I don't I never has spoken to him or ever aspired to. He did the show like three weeks ago. Dude, it was the best segment we did all year. And, and it went on and on. He stayed like an hour and just like it was amazing. So I think there's been so much I've learned from talking to people that know more than I do. You know, I, I, that used to be the reason I would put the radio on or follow the Associated Press or pick up the paper was to learn things. And one thing I want to say about sports in this time for both of us, and we love sports so much, and it's all we've ever done. Man, the, the five or six months when it went away and then it comes back and it hasn't really been normal, the football part has been the part that's felt almost normal to me the last eight weeks. Well, I, you know, I, I don't know. I mean, I, you know, I covered the Pirates too, obviously, and so I got my baseball fix. And, you know, the Pirates, the attendance of Pirate games can be spotty, right, just like <laughs> it can be for the Orioles, right? So it wasn't really that big a deal to not have fans in the stands there. But with the, in the NFL games, and I don't know if this has happened at the Ravens games yet, but a couple of times the Steelers games where especially when they go like break between quarters, they will cut off that white noise that they play to, to kind of replicate the, the sound of the fans. And that is just jarring. I mean, that is, now they allowed fan, fans in um, last week, 5,500. So there was some supplemental noise in there, but I mean, that's, I, I don't know. I mean, I think to me, baseball was the most normal and football is still a little, Weird. I mean, I tell you what, if they, I mean, whoever came up with the idea that we need the noise more than we need like cardboard cutouts or tarps or whatever, like that to me is the, I mean, that's the most noticeable aspect of it. So that when you watch it on TV, it absolutely looks like for the most part, and you can tell they're being very careful with camera angles when they get to the ground and stuff like that. But that is the, still sometimes being in the stadium when it's empty is just, it's a, it's a weird thing. The, Best, uh, uh, you know, the Pittsburgh team we've seen here in a couple of years. Uh, the, a pretty good version of the Ravens right now, reeling from that comeback against uh, the Eagles uh, brought up two weeks ago. But, but this, is, this is really good. These are two good teams. This is a good football game. We saw a weekend on the couch last weekend. We were supposed to be playing you guys. And just good games. And the league has done a really representative job here at a time when, you know, and I don't want to, dog baseball seven inning games and their double headers and all the nonsense that went on there the bubbles of basketball and hockey which were I didn't watch a lot of basketball or hockey I just didn't I wasn't drawn to it in August on a hundred degree night having a snowball you know but the football thing I've been drawn to it and it's been worthwhile it's been the escape that I sort of need on a Sunday no, it's certainly, you know, this Sunday with the, the Steelers being in Tennessee, our great uh, Titans writer, Teresa Walker, covered the game. I was sort of helping her out. I got on the Zooms and did that stuff. But I also had Red Zone on, which is a, you know, a, a you know, it is a break from, I mean, look, my kids, I have two kids. They're in school a couple of days a week. They're home the rest of the week trying to, you know, do the, their own Zoom meeting. So, I mean, yes, I certainly appreciate that there is some sort of routine involved. Um, and, and the product, I think, has been, on the whole has been pretty good. And these Steelers are, you know, they're sort of drama free. I mean, we can, you know, we can talk about 
who's not here anymore. I mean, I think Antonio Brown not being here is a big deal. I mean, I think you really, really feel it now because there isn't, you know, he wasn't here last year, but Ben only got six quarters in, right? And then once that happened, like the whole season basically ended. Um, so so it, this seems very sort of normal. Um, I do miss, like I miss being in the locker room. At all the beats that I cover, the NFL is the one where I believe you get the, the best ability to sort of, you know, connect with the players more so than, than hockey and baseball. And that's something against those guys. It's just the nature of, of that Steelers locker room. And so I miss that. Um, I miss that part. I miss seeing them on Zoom. I don't know if they miss seeing us in person or not. Um, but they're like, they're the good. Zoom I, chats, the way- dude, as a journalist, the Zoom thing, it feels like they're hostages. I mean, it feels like yeah, a yeah. hostage video to me. And I, I'm, I, I've now left Washington and Philadelphia at the end of the game because, because I, I have the, after 24 years of doing this, most of after the game ends means I'm on an airplane and I hope you know the deal, right? right? This year we've had these weird games and I'm doing the road games and Luke is doing the home games, right? So the home games I watch on TV. So I find it very odd how hard it is to watch a game on TV when you can't see the secondary, you know, right, you can't see right. the secondary. You're not watching the game. You're watching the ball. And so that's the home experience. The road experience has been an empty stadium in Houston and zooming from the roof with one other reporter from the Baltimore Sun, Joan. There's only two reporters from Baltimore, two humans from Baltimore outside the organization in Houston. Then the Washington and Philadelphia were drivable, but also like, why was I going to sit in that press box to zoom questions that I can do in my car? I walked out. Mr. Snyder gave me parking in the platinum lot, Will. Uh, and I literally got home at 4.53 to my home in Baltimore at, in the city. Like, I watched the whole press conference in my car. And if I had a question, I could raise my hand. And I, right. I you know, I didn't. And I really don't because I don't think we're getting good questions or good answers in any. We're not learning much about these players during this period of time. Oh, other than they show up on Sunday at 1 o'clock. And. And, and right now, that's enough, right? That's, that's enough for me for now. For now, yeah. I mean, I, I am cons- – there's a look, there's a lot of consternation along – and then this goes for, for, the, for the Baseball Writers Association of America, which I'm also in, you know, pro football writers, the hockey – you know, the, the professional hockey writers. I mean, there are – there's a real concern about access after this, like if we go back to normal. Um, but I don't They're know. They're never I mean, letting us like, back in, by the I way. I mean, and it's – that's tough because it is. I've watched I mean, like, those soccer players do their little glass thing, <laughs> you know, for 20 years. And I'm like, that's where we're heading. This is going to be a lot less fun. I mean, it's, um, you know, I, I look, there are guys in the Steelers locker room that I go to, regardless of what, of their role in the game. But if you want to get a real gauge on what's going on with the team, there are guys like David Castro, um, guys like Kim Hayward, you know, that, that have been since I got here basically have been sort of the guys that, that know what's going on and will tell you and, and not really having that sort of one-on-one interaction. I mean, it's just tough. And it's the same. I mean, like, I don't know what the Ravens are doing. The Steelers are giving us basically the same 10 guys throughout the week. And look, James Conner talked to us last Friday. James is having a, a, a really good season for him. He's staying healthy. He's holding on to the ball. He's being productive in all phases. Um, it's a big year for him. And I tell you what, it was like maybe the fifth week in a row he'd been made available on a Friday. He did not want to talk. I mean, he was—he could not have been more sullen if he was a three-year-old that missed his nap time. And I'm not dissing James. I mean, that is – but he's just sort of – I'm just – that's sort of an example of a guy just being over it. And, I mean, as a journalist, we're sort of over it too. We, we don't love this either, but it's part of our job. It's part of their job. And, you know, hopefully there's something on the other side. I mean, that's, 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 well, Connor's an incredible story. Like, you know, from a guy in Baltimore, he's a guy that I would love to have on and sit with my wife and do 20 minutes about their journey. And I know, you know, you've had your own journey there, there, there there is a part to me that he's a a good part of the league. He's, he's a great story. He's a great local story in the week when we're playing the Steelers. That's the kind of humanity I think we all need. Well, I will get to the election, right, but part I think, but I right now, but I, I think that part of him, and we're like we're five years out from his diagnosis. I believe it's you no, know, it was November of fifteen. He announced his diagnosis. It might have been early December. You know, great comeback. Gets drafted by the Steelers, but then he's got to replace Le'Veon. He has trouble. He has a great first half of twenty eighteen. Then he basically has spent the last year and a half explaining why he got hurt at various times and he's just sort of over I get that he's over it I mean I get it I get it I understand and I even wrote my story I wrote last Friday it was basically like he is over all this stuff he just wants to play 
but it's just an example of, as you mentioned, the hostage situation where he just was like, dude, you know, like, uh, okay, I don't want to really answer your questions. And, and I respect that. But the problem is like, I can't go talk to somebody else. This is who's available in this. Format. Yeah. So that's what we have to do. But I'm looking forward to the game. I really, look, I still think that the Chiefs are, the Chiefs are here. The Chiefs are, you know, they got bored against the Raiders and they didn't really show up. And they just, I mean, that, that happens. They're going to win that division by, thought the division locked up by December 1st, probably. You know, and I still think regardless of, of what happens, I think, you know, I think they can go anywhere and win. I really think the Chiefs can absolutely, we saw that, you know, again, with the Ravens. I mean, they, they put it to the Ravens when they met. Um, I think the Steelers need to be at home. If they want to go to the Super Bowl, they need to be at home. And, and being at home means you have to beat the Ravens probably twice in my opinion probably twice because i don't think you're gonna see the chiefs lose more than one. More I, you know the home and road thing I, I i can't get stirred up because i don't think under any condition lamar jackson is going to roll into arrowhead with forty two thousand people there breathing on him i don't i don't <laughs> think that's going to happen and i i don't even know what the bubble is going to contain in january i mean the home and road thing doesn't feel nearly um as significant as my wife's not going to be in the front row of the upper deck yelling at Ben Roethlisberger this week. Right. I mean, I didn't, somebody, people brought that up to me, but I, I still think there's a psychological component to it. Um, and I do think, you know, there are some, there are, I mean, look, who knows, who knows what it's going to look like. I don't know how many Kansas City's letting in now. It might be 10,000. Um, but, you know, obviously look, I mean, that number could change to zero next week. Right. I mean, like that's sort of where we're at. Uh, but I just think it's, you know, I think the Steelers, this is a really, really big game for them. Um, I think this is, and if they get through this, I mean, after that, they have, what, they're at Dallas and they have the Bengals at home and then they're at the Jags, right? So, I mean, you could conceivably, if they somehow win this game, they, they could be 10-0 and when the Ravens come on Thanksgiving night, which would be pretty incredible. Um, well, it would be a real mess for the Ravens to lose this game, right? I mean, it'd be two behind, and now, like, you're sort of sitting behind the Chiefs and the Steelers or the perception thereof. Right. and the feeling about being behind the Chiefs and that feeling you just gave us from the top, which is there's the Chiefs and there's everybody else. Well, yeah, we, I mean, we've been beaten by him three years. And, you know, I mean, Lamar mentions kryptonite in the press conference on the, you know, in the hostage video, right? Like, so it's, it's a little in their heads around here for the time being that we would far prefer to have Pittsburgh take Kansas City out, you know, not see them, you know? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I think every uh... – I mean, I just think they're, I just think they're loaded, but this Steelers team is, I mean, look, they're good. I don't think like, they're not great. I mean, I, I, the defense is close to being great, but they keep having these lapses. I mean, you know, much like the Ravens, when the Ravens play the Eagles, the Steelers got up 17 on the Eagles and at home and midway through the third quarter. And what happened? I mean, they Wentz leads them for two, two, for two touchdowns and they have the ball and a chance to take the lead late. Um, and the Steelers get a stop and then they get one more Chase Claypool touchdown and, and win the game. Much last week, they're, you know, they, they are lights out. They look incredible in the first half. They have a defensive breakdown for a long touchdown. The offense does, Ben throws a couple of picks. And all of a sudden, they got to sweat out a missed field goal at the end of regulation. So, I mean, they are perfect, but they are not playing perfectly, which is not a bad place to be, you know, seven weeks into the season. He is Will Graves. You can follow him out on Twitter at Will Graves AP. He's been covering uh, Yin Zanat up in the Berg for uh, quite some time now, but is a transplanted Marylander and uh, I believe one time Capitals supporter as well as an Oriole Redskin type of guy. And yeah. you cover the Pirates up there. Uh, much love to Jimmy Trudenich and everybody up there with the Buckos and. Uh, and you've seen the sort of demise of baseball there as I look at your picture of Dave Parker and, you know, Tomlin ran me around that day. We went to the baseball game up there to that alley where there's Clemente and Stargell and, you know, yeah. all of those things that tie Baltimore and Pittsburgh together back in the 70s with baseball uh, and your family's history, my father and all of that. Um, baseball, man, like – I don't know what to say, man. My last name's Aparicio, and I'm not proud of this. And Luke would slap me around, and he knows that I'm not watching. I haven't watched any of this. I haven't been into it. The Orioles stink. They're a joke. Um, nobody's going to the games. They're in the last year of, of a 30-year lease. Nobody's talking. The kid's wearing cowboy boots down in Nashville where they want a team. Uh, there's no commerce around the Orioles here. There's no heartbeat. There's no yeah. – 
caravan of love of goodwill of here we are and we're the Orioles and we we're getting you through this pandemic. They just disappear, man. You know, and they they barely played. They barely played at all. They were a little bit on TV and. It's over now, and here we go. And they didn't really want to play to begin with. And, and I would think it's probably the same thing with the Pirates. And I'm, I'm wondering for, like, all white guys like you and me that love this stuff, and when I'm not watching and they're not getting my money and they're not getting my attention, and I'm not watching game one of the World Series or two or three or four, and the night that I wanted to watch, I realized that, oh, Monday Night Football was on and they're not even playing. I, I've never felt more – distant from it and I don't know how it's going to get back to me and I don't know how the Pirates and the Orioles are going to get it back to Yins and that and and people in the suburbs here to get people back into giving their wallets over to watch it and come see it well I mean you know look I, I have a, I'm in a semi-unique situation my my 11 year old son is a is a budding baseball player he's pretty good um, we are making a significant investment in his development. He loves the Pirates, or he loved, let me rephrase, he loved the Pirates. I mean, he, in his truly formative years, five, six, seven, eight, they were competitive. They were in the playoffs during that little stretch. He, I mean, he has a, you know, but the problem is, like, if we went into his drawer, there is a, a stack of jerseys, right? But they're guys that are not here anymore. Kutch, Garrett Cole. Josh Harris. I, I was Earl there the Sterling day Martin. they did the Alvarez giveaway in the in the yellow throwback right. of 79 that we're familiar with. I was at the ballpark the day they gave that away. And I thought, you know, where, where are those 22,000 jerseys today, right? Yeah, I mean, it's, so it's, I mean, I, I think it's, it's tough for the fans because there's, they can't get emotion. There's no real point in getting emotionally connected to a player because they are going to be gone when they cost too much. That is, just, I mean, that is, and then when you look, they brought in Ben Sherrington, who's a new GM last year. Um, you know, he's basically doing a reboot, trying to model them basically after the Rays and the A's. That's what they're trying to do. The Rays especially, you know, like don't get attached to anybody too much because they're going to be gone once they get to arbitration and, and command, you know, their tr salary quadruples. I mean, but they're really good at developing players. So, I mean, I think, look, the, a couple of things that Baltimore and Pittsburgh both have going for them is, you know, although let, let's, you know, I, I think that the ballparks are incredible, right? I mean, and I think that part of the thing is that the, the Pirates can kind of like, they can lose 120 games every year, but you're still going to get families that come to the ballpark during the summer. And, you know, it's a beautiful place to watch a game. I mean, I missed not, I mean, I covered probably 20 of the 30 home games they had. And I missed going with my family. I missed going and sitting in there and, and drinking my beer and, and, you know, you get the downtown skyline. I mean, I think there is, that value is always going to be there for, and I think in some ways that because of that, Bob Nutting is not, there isn't, the owner isn't, there isn't any real incentive to kind of go out and spend a ton of money because, well, I'm going to get X no matter what. I mean, I think that's, that's where he's at. And I don't blame him. I mean, look, he's a businessman. He can, he hasn't, he hasn't been as, you know, intentionally, almost intentionally bad as Peter Angelos has been to the, like, I, I think Nutting is just, he, he can, you can say he's cheap or whatever, but look, I mean, he did, shortly after he came on board, they started with Neil Huntington and they built it up and they had a, a good four to five year run where they got better. They had, I mean, they, Kutch was a MVP in 13 and a, a finalist in 12 and 14. I mean, so they had stars. I could not name you two Orioles right now. I could not. My son can because he plays on the show, right? And sometimes he'll get drafted by the Orioles. And so he'll play. <laughs> I mean, that is literally his connection to the team. But I, I think that there is, you know, I, I do think that, you know, it's all about, I think people want to, they want to see good, a quality product. And I think until, you know, they're waiting to, the re, to really come back. I mean, the Pirates attendance is down 35% from what it was in, in 2015. And their, their wins are down like 35% from what they were in 2015. And I think it's sort of, just goes a hand in hand thing. But I do think that there is a, a sleeping giant. I do think that if they got good again, you know, even if it was just for a year or two with a group that they knew was sort of like, okay, as soon as this guy reaches an all-star MVP level and he gets into the third year of arbitration, we are flipping him for two guys that can start and play and pin a minimum. I think that, I think they'd be on board with that. Yeah, there's no Clemente or Stargell. And around here, you know, we're watching Manny Machado run around with the Padres. That would have been the guy, you know, had this thing sort of been normal. And now we have these Astros guys, and we're going to lose a lot. And who knows? The Astros won by cheating. That's, you know, well documented at this point. So it, it really is strange, but the last year of the lease 
is the part that, that concerns me the most. And when you talk about um, honor, you know, the, the Angelos era here for three decades has really been marked by dishonor. You know, I mean, more than anything, oh, yeah. it's, he's been such a dishonorable, dishonest person um, in the way all of this has been done. And it's really, uh, it's been devastating like, to I the mean, city. It really has been. Right. And much like, much like, I mean, much like what Snyder's done to the Washington football team's fan yeah. base. I mean, I, I grew up, I mean, like, and I mentioned this to you before, the first sporting event I remember going to was the 82 NFC championship game where they beat the Cowboys to go to the Super Bowl. I was eight years old. And it was like, I mean, it was like having a drug just inject of adrenaline just injected into my vein, right? I mean, I hooked. I mean, I knew, like, I, look, I thought I was going to be a receiver for the Reds, Redskins. That obviously didn't work out. But, I mean, I knew I needed to be around this, whatever this was, this this feeling, these people. I mean, the stands are rocky. I mean, I, re I remember chanting, we want Dallas. And, just, and I never thought at that moment in time, and even after, I mean, look, they won their – they beat the Bills when I was a senior in high school, and I thought, well, they're just going to be good forever. Like, this is just how it's supposed the to be. The Mark Rippon to Canton. You know, and, and obviously, look, they've been pretty – I mean, I'm, I'm 46 years old, and they've been pretty bad. And I have basically divorced myself emotionally from them. And could Fair they enough. Well, that's where I am with the Orioles, and anybody that knows me knows that because – on top of that, they personally treated me and my family like trash, too. So there's that for me, but I'm not the only one. You know, if it was just me, the upper deck would still be full, and they'd be packing them in, and there'd be no nationals. But the nationals are also a huge part of this because everybody you went to high school with, if they oh, do yeah. like baseball, they've got, like, a real team down there. Yeah, and my son, look, my son loves – I mean, I, you know, this might be part of my son's first – because he's a bandwagon jumper, like – Okay. He did like, like three years ago, his favorite play, the NBA player was Steph Curry. And then it was, um, it was Porzingis for like well, five Well, you're minutes. allowed to do that and when then, you're well, a no, kid. And then, well, and then, but then like so in baseball, he went from like, you know, he went, he went to Harper. And then he went to Trout and he went back to Harper. But when Harper went to the Phillies, he was like, I'm done with him. He said, so that is good. So my son is still a Nats fan because um, he wants to be emotionally invested. He's actually rooting for the Rays in the world series. I'm not sure why that is. I think mostly because he knows I like the Dodgers. That's probably, that's probably what that is. But I mean, it's interesting, you know, I know you, you, you talk about politics and I'm going to, I'm going to give you my little analogy. Oh, here. anyone so, from Pennsylvania sort of, that wants to talk about politics. I, sort of I, want, I, need to hear about general. I mean, I would, be, I would view, I'm not going to betray my political affiliation, but I will simply say that on both sides now, it seems like, like, look, for example, the Redskins, I grew up loving them. I'm emotionally divorced from them, but guess what? I still hate the Cowboys. And I know my mother, who still lives in Waldorf, um, took great pleasure in the, them beating the tar out of the Cowboys, uh, you know, last weekend. And I think this, I think politics is now like that. I think when I look at the party that I identify with and I go, I'm not, not thrilled with this, I'm not thrilled with this. But then when they go to play the other side, when they go to play the, the rivals, when they go to play the Cowboys, I'm like, well, I don't know how I feel about my group here, but I still can't stand that group. And I really think that is, that is politics in general. I mean, I think that is. Well, that's Steelers that. week here. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so, and, and it'll be very, look, I mean, uh, am I concerned about, um, you know, I trust the, the process. I mean, I trust that, you know, this country was built on something that is not tied into one or two people. I mean, it is not. I mean, that was the way that they built it. I will say this though, um, you know, when you look at just the, the evolution of humanity, not even in the United States, but at large in the last 246 years, it's going one way. And every, well, every once in a while people come along and try to push back and kind of stuff it back in the toothpaste, back in the tube and you can't. And I think people that don't recognize progress and don't recognize that people that don't look like me need to have equal representation, that's a problem. And I am, it's a huge problem. And, 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 I, and I look, and I am, look, and I say this, and I, you know, as a 46 year old white male who has never college educated, middle class, I've never had to worry about where a um, meal has come from in my life. I've never worried, had to worry about where shelter has come from in my life. I've never had, worried, had to worry about if I show up to vote, are they going to let me vote? I've never had to worry about that. But I recognize and understand that there are people, a lot of people, that have that issue. And until we, address that everything else i'm sorry everything we can get to the rest of it we can get to the rest of it 
but we got to bring everybody up on a, on the same plane and that is my hope for what happened. And this is not just for this, this, this two, next Tuesday, whatever. I mean, it is literally like for the rest of my life and my children's life and their kids' life that we, I mean, it's, it, what do they always say? A more perfect union, a more, that's in order to form a more perfect union. Well, we're still working on the perfect, much like the Steelers. The Steelers are six to no. They know they're not perfect. I view this country, hey, best country on the planet, still not perfect. Got to work towards it. And I hope people, 30,000 put do this thing and not just look at it as like, you know, my side, their side. I mean, cause that's, it's, it's, it's just so short sighted and stupid. And well, I just, you know, and it, all it, of it, our parents put a lot into this, you know what I mean? Yes. To, to get us to this point where um, we can have nice things as they say, right? Uh, like the internet and Zoom, where I can look at you, Will Graves. Will Graves, AP, he is a sports writer up in Pittsburgh, covering all <laughs> things Pittsburgh, other than the fish that saved Pittsburgh. And uh, uh, maybe we'll uh, revisit, revisit that if we get stuck in shelter here all winter. Don't <laughs> have any For more Dr. Sports. J somewhere. Yeah, you know, it was one of my favorite movies back in the day. You know, Stalker Channing and uh, some others. <laughs> but, uh, hey, man, a pleasure. I'm sorry we're not seeing each other. I don't know that I'm going to get up there for Thanksgiving to uh, eat Mr. Rooney's cookies. Uh, I don't know how I feel about the uh, in and out on Thanksgiving. Like a, it would be a soggy prepackaged sandwich, and I apologize for that. That's just sort of where we're at. Yeah, maybe I'll skip this. When Charlie Batch says when things get better, he's going to have me up for a foundation thing. So I'll yeah. come back up there when times are better, and we'll go to Regatta or something down at Point State <laughs> Park, all right? <laughs> Sounds good, man. Best to your family. I think the Ravens win, by the way, by three. So Just three, huh? Yeah. Well, I hope we get a good game. I mean, I, yeah. I – Again, these Sundays, we get through the other six days of the week to get to a football game where we can sort of turn our phones off of that channel for a little while. And uh, I've, uh, I've used it. It's been good mental health for me this football season. It's just because we win a lot, too. <laughs> <laughs> it does help, for sure. Take care. Will Graves, AP, joining yeah. us here. You can find him out in the Associated Press as well as on the Twitter thing and up in Pennsylvania with his boy playing baseball, watching hockey, chronicling football and doing all things at the Associated Press. You can find our merger of all things sports and politics and local and arts. And I even sat down with JY from Sticks last week to talk about how in the <laughs> hell Renegade ever became the Steelers song. So it's the stuff we're doing. Will, we're taking a deep dive. It's a plague. You know, you have to ask the tough questions during the plague. You know? <laughs> so somebody's got to do it. Martin O'Malley joining us this week, as well as John Sarbanes on the eve of the election, as well as Election Palooza 4 with Don Moeller and a whole bunch of podcasters here in Maryland. I am Nestor. We are WNST.net, AM 1570, Taos of Baltimore. We never stop talking Steelers and Ravens and Ravens and Steelers and Baltimore Positive.